Um, okay, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to the last uh, seminar of the Climate Science Informal Seminars. Today we have Andrew Pantel who will present Forage and Water Resiliency uh, Planning Tool for Management. And I also acknowledge that we reside in the unceded traditional territory of the Clay Litany Nation. And thank you, Andrew, for joining us today. Thank you. You're ready to go. Yeah, okay, great. Um, all right, I will see if I can share my screen here. How is that? Okay, great. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm Andrew and um, I've been working as a consultant with the BC Cattlemen's Association on this project for about the last five years. Um, previous to that, uh, there was a project that was similar with the Caribou Cattlemen's Association, uh, looking at uh, the risk of um, climate change and drought on the on the water and the forage resource on Crown Crown Range or public land, I guess uh, land that has has. Um, range tenure over it and just trying to see what the what the risks are to um, to livestock grazing on these on these lands based on on climate change scenarios. And so this presentation is kind of oh, let's see if it'll click forward on here. There we go. So I'll just give a brief background of the project uh, and how we kind of incorporate climate change into range management with the with a climate model. Um, a look at an example of, of what the planning process looks like using this, this tool, as, as well as uh, how we bring kind of other land uses or land use considerations into uh, managing for, for range um, in, in a changing climate or just within land use plans and how this tool is used to assist those, um, the planning process and, and other land uses. And then I'll talk about a couple of applications where it's been uh, used successfully on on range in BC. So the original project was a uh, livestock surface water risk assessment in the caribou. And it started off with a, a report and then uh, there was a workshop with producers and, and as well as government and some, some industry folks. And then there was a pilot uh, project uh, implementation and monitoring. So there was um, some water developments that were put in using the planning process, and then those those water developments or the, those pilot projects were demonstrated during a field day uh, over two days. I guess not last September, but the September before, um, in in and around Williams Lake. And so this led to um, some key sort of findings and summaries and next steps and. And generally, it was it was showing, uh, as I'm sure we're well, well aware, that the interior Douglas fir zones are mostly at risk to uh, to changes in, in surface water and to for, for livestock, as those are areas that have probably some of the higher forage potential. Um, and so, what kind of knowledge did we get out of this process? And then also incorporating the climate projections into range management. Um, you know, how do we take this, this large model or these, these large uh, landscape scale type um, climate projections and, and incorporate them into on the ground planning and, and solving challenges. So the biggest challenge is linking this, the climate model at, at a regional or a district or a provincial scale even uh, to a scale that's useful for managing livestock or, or for planning range management. And, and so how do we take it from uh, a regional scale to a range unit or uh, down to a pasture uh, unit in, and um, yeah, just the downscaling of these, of the models is sometimes difficult. Uh, and, and so how did we, you know, how, how do we, how do we do that? And that's part of what this, this presentation will be. So there are eight maps that were developed through this tool. There's reference evaporation maps, so the EREF for the current climate and a 2050s climate scenario, uh, as well as um, maps for the current back as well as a projected 
uh, back zones with, with the 2050s climate scenarios, forage category maps, similar to, for those more familiar with forestry, it'd be similar to a vegetation resource inventory map, but it is focused on the forage, or, and so we call it a more of a range vegetation inventory, and it is much uh, more clumped than split. So the categories, uh, you know, instead of having some hundred categories, or I'm not sure how many are in the VRA, but there's plenty, uh, it is, there's about uh, eight to 12 forage categories that are, that are used. Uh, there's a slope map, as well as a map called a flow accumulation, which looks at um, more of a, a watershed type analysis in terms of uh, where water is accumulating, potentially accumulating on the landscape, helping to assess closed versus uh, open basin ponds or connected ponds, and as well as a disturbance history, which, which helps um, sort of uh, visualize what's happening to forage on the landscape. And so uh, this presentation will kind of go through how, how these, these maps or this tool is, is used for, for range management. So in general, the, the planning process is identifying an area of interest and, and most often we use a, a range unit or a range tenure area. Um, and then this area can be stratified by pastures or management zones if they exist within. And the maps are used to uh, assist with identify, identifying the forage categories and plant communities, um, range vegetation types and those forest cover types. And on top of that forage category or, or RVI map, we, we assign um, zones of use. And so this is where the climate model gets used mostly is based on this, this zones of use and it's based on distance to water and it identifies water that's resilient versus water that's threatened. Um, and then through that we, yeah, that's a, a review of the climate model that includes these resilient and threatened boundaries as well as uh, potential shifts in forage. And I'll go, through, I'll go through those. And then the final product is sort of to build a forage allocation table. So how, how do we assign production values to the landscape? and aluminum factors and then a, a final carrying capacity based on, on the, the, the planning process. So generally, uh, the area of interest that we look at from a range management scale can be, this would be a watershed uh, scale and uh, the forage map. So the forage map is on the right. So that shows all the different forage communities within that watershed and then uh, the map on the left is is just is the Beck zones for the current uh, climate, and um, so generally we would identify a, an area of interest. So it could be a watershed, uh, but most commonly we use a range a range unit boundary or a range agreement area boundary, and so these areas can be anywhere from um, you know five hundred hectares to twenty thousand hectares. And so they, they can incorporate a number of watersheds or, or they can be within, many of them can be within a single watershed depending on, on uh, how you select your boundaries. But uh, the point being is that the, the maps can be created and the, and the planning can be created to any, any sort of uh, scale. Um, so yeah, so the pasture unit, the, the, the watershed unit um, or, or the range unit. And so the range unit is on would be on the right and a pasture boundary would, would be sort of in the, in the center. So this boundary is about 600 hectares versus the 100,000 hectares associated with a, with a watershed on the left versus about 6,000 hectares associated with the range unit on the right. So varying scales uh, are used to, to present the information um, depending on, on um, the questions that are being asked around uh, management questions. So the, the most commonly used um, maps are looking at, at the water resources, so the distance to water, as well as the forage resource. So what is the forage on the, on the land base as well as how is it changing through uh, future climate scenarios? And the water resources are assessed based on um, resilience to, to drought or to and so drought or, or, the, or the 2050s climate scenario are, are kind of uh, synonymous, I guess I use those terms kind of synonymously in a sense because um, 
the climate change projections are, are suggesting that there's going to be uh, a warmer, drier climate, and that's going to put more risk on, on surface water. And what so what is the risk in terms of water on the rangeland, and, and how does that relate to livestock use? Generally, we get reduced water quality and quantity uh, as, the, as ponds evaporate, especially smaller ponds. And this can lead to decisions around where we should be putting resources to protect uh, wetlands or protect water resources uh, that, are, that are necessary for livestock on Crown Range and, and which ones need more protection um, than others so that the situation on the, on the left is avoided. There's also implications for wetlands and ecosystem services as, as wetlands dry up. It's, I think it's important to sort of recognize which wetlands are at risk as well as um, understanding that as wetlands become drier, they can um, be more susceptible to uh, livestock in terms of uh, as the ground is drier, it's easier for livestock to get further out into them and, and uh, degrade them if, if management considerations aren't being made for, um, for these situations. So the model in general ha is based on, and I'll, I'll kind of show how it looks uh, on the next slide, but uh, it's based on a relationship between the surface area and the volume of a pond. And um, typically, typically grassland ponds would, would be considered uh, closed basins in, in, so, in some situations as they have very little sort of inputs throughout the summer other than uh, surface water sources or, or um, just catchment within their watershed. So they don't have a, uh, any th through flow like a, a fen or something like that. They're typically more, I would characterize them for, for people more uh, familiar with forests as a bog as opposed to a, a fen where there's, where there's water that flows through them and recharging them throughout the summer. Um, and there are, th those ponds do exist obviously, but um, this model is based on the assumption that, that the ponds that we're looking at are closed basin. And so it, it estimates if, the, if a pond has a certain area that it also has a certain volume. And this relationship is fairly strong for small ponds. Um, but once you get over sort of five, seven hectares then the relationship starts to fall apart, but the regression is fairly strong for, for ponds that are um, sort of under, under seven hectares. And so each pond or wetland in, in BC, we've, we've, uh, we've assigned a number to it essentially, and then created a table that um, estimates pond full based on, um, just based on, on um, the trim layer. And so that pond will have a, a pond full area at the start of, of May. And then from there, um, the reference evaporation and precipitation is applied to it to uh, sort of show how that pond is projected to evolve through the grazing season or through the growing season. So from, from the beginning of May through the end of August. And, and this can be lengthened to go all the way through October. Um, but generally what it shows is that ponds that are uh, less than two, two hectares are are becoming um, you know, more than 60% or 70% smaller in area, whereas ponds that are two to five hectares in size are becoming uh, either 50% smaller in volume or 50% smaller in area. And that's how we've assigned a risk value to those thinking that that's a, um, and it's, it's, not a, it's, it's not a perfect, um, I guess like applying that number isn't 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 perfect, but it it, it provides a um, a good starting point in terms of of assessing the land assessing ponds at a landscape scale to determine which are at risk and which are uh, not at risk to to drying down to a significant amount throughout the, the growing season. And so, what it creates for range management is it creates two areas on the landscape. One where water is resilient and one where water is threatened. And why that's important is that livestock will generally travel about 1.5 kilometers from 
a water source to, to feed throughout the day or to forage throughout the day. And so knowing which water sources are resilient throughout the uh, future climate change scenarios uh, allows sort of a, an, an ability to plan or to assign areas or zones of use to, to livestock throughout the to livestock within a range unit. And so range units have often these irregular boundaries based on uh, maybe based on infrastructure, based on like roads and such or uh, watershed boundaries or something, but not all of the area is generally accessible to, to livestock. And one way to stratify the landscape is to identify those zones that are one and a half kilometers from water in general. And then another stratification is to identify those zones that are uh, within one and a half kilometers of resilient water. And so how that plays out on the uh, climate change um, question is, is if we have resilient water, so water that's that's greater than five uh, hectares in area, um, we can we can allocate forage around those areas. And we know that that's our reliable forage resource, whereas threatened water bodies, those ones that are two to five hectares in size, are uh, at risk in drought years or in future climate change scenarios. And, and so you get two, gen two areas on the landscape. You have one area, so the, the lightly shaded polygon is the area that is, is generally uh, considered not at risk in the current climate, but will be in future climate. And then the dark shaded area is, or the dark highlighted colored area is, is the area that is uh, available in, in the current, situation as well as in future climate scenarios. So the implications for, for water, for livestock, create this um, kind of cascading effect. It's also uh, reducing the amount of forage that's potentially available on the landscape. And um, so within, there's, that's for the, for, that's for the general water, how the water resource is looked at. And for the forage resource, um, we can take these maps now that we have and we can calculate the different area of our forage categories um, based on distance to water or within the entire range unit itself. So we can have uh, areas associated with um, open forest, aspen leading deciduous open range. So these are our, our main broad forage categories. And, um, and then we assign a forage value to those categories and then we can assign a, a carrying capacity and that's kind of what I'll, I'll work through. But um, to the take home from this, from this slide is that uh, the area that is associated with green circles or green polygons is resilient water, whereas the area that's associated, that is at risk is, is the areas that are associated with, with um, the red circles. So we think of future climate change scenarios would be removing those red circles from our allocation of, of forage because there's no water there. And, and um, whereas the areas of green and red combined are, is our current forage resource. And the area outside of those uh, is the potential forage resource if there's uh, investments made in water developments or to bring to bring water to those areas to uh, for for livestock, and and so that's how it's kind of uh, used as a little bit of a, a planning tool. Um, so the forage numbers that we have are based on forage sampling that's taken place since about 2015. And so, uh, for example, in the IDF in open range, and we have we have forage sampling through most of the different uh, Beck zones that. Uh, livestock are are grazing in in the province, and and so some of our data is quite quite strong. The IDF open range is approximately 838 kilograms per hectare with 31 sample points. Um, in Aspen leading, there's 28 sample points, and in the grassland communities, there's 37 sample points. So uh, I think we're dealing with about 1,400 sample points in total throughout the province where that provides the data that goes into the forage categories. And in terms of climate change, how we're looking at this is, um, I'll just back up here. 
So we would just be applying these numbers to the areas within the circles, depending on whether we are looking at current climate or future climate scenarios. Um, and it can be applied throughout the entire range unit, but really when calculating carrying capacity, uh, we're only looking at areas that livestock have, have uh, access to um, based on that concept that they'll only generally travel one and a half kilometers from, from reliable water. So how does climate change come into this, the forage projection? Um, so we take the, the, current, the current climate Beck maps, and then we apply the, the Beck and the 2050 climate scenarios to the same area, and then we can make adjustments. So if, if right now, if we have open range IDF as 838 kilograms per hectare, if that area, which would be right around, uh, it's changing, say, um, I guess up through the up through the valley of Dead Man Creek, uh, is changing from a uh, IDF to a, a bunch grass. Then we would shift our forage allocation, and we would say, well, the B, the bunch grass system is only producing 636 uh, kilograms per hectare in open range right now, based on our limited samples of of 11 points. But that's the number that we would apply to sort of provide some uh, suggestions around what our um, estimate is for future forage resource. And the same with the Aspen. So Aspen leading uh, right now in the MS, we, we only have one sample point. And, and so um, we, have, we don't have very good sampling in the, in the MS, but we have very good sampling, 28 points in the IDF. And so uh, it also helps us to understand where we need more sampling occurring based on if we're getting uh, range units that have uh, a big shift from the MS to IDF or vice versa, um, then, then it gives us a, an understanding that we need to get more sample points for that. And uh, same with uh, a grassland system going from IDF into um, a, a PP situation, then forage production is dropping by to about 250 kilograms per hectare. And so our future climate uh, forage project projections have to decrease if that's the situation that's happening on that watershed or that landscape. And so it's it helps as a, a planning tool to assist with, with future forage projections. So there's a few other maps that were used. And I think what I'll do is I'll just like go through the kind of some of the applications, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, around how how these were used, I think it's yeah. It seems like I, I find it's an easier way to explain things, and um, and it's a little bit more like on the ground. So um, in the Rocky Mountain District, we use this process and these maps to um, create what was called the Peckham's Restoration Plan. So this is a conservation focused plan, and the area had funding for projects. So we're able to uh, apply um, some of the the knowledge from the maps to specific strategies, and then use and then use that process for funding applications. Um, yeah, so I, I went through this part already, but just yeah, again, they use the same sort of planning process where it identified the units. So it was a Peckham's Range unit stratified by the pastures. There was about fifteen different pastures, I think. And then the maps were used to identify the forage categories and the zones of use. And then we built these forage allocation tables based on, based on that information. And, and it followed the general format of this plan followed that within the modern land use planning uh, guidance. And um, the reason I guess why I'm showing this is just, it, it emphasized that um, by listing the, the range values or the values that range management has on the landscape, there's a lot of overlap with other values within these modern within land use plans, and um, it assists with with communicating the range values throughout the landscape with the other with the other um, land uses. And so, generally, range has you know, not, I guess these are, I would say these are primary, the primary values, so upland health, ecosystem health, in terms of riparian um, zones and riparian management, 
uh, wildlife habitat, uh, identifying use zones of use with, with livestock also, and identifying zones where wildlife are, are using the landscape heavily, um, can assist with, with managing forage, um, range management in general, just developing carrying capacities, planning water developments, planning range health, where range health assessments occur. Uh, so these maps can be used for, for all of those activities. And then also communicating range use with other land users as well as indigenous and cultural values um, around where planning might overlap um, and impact water or culturally important areas, plants or, or wildlife. Um, there's also the secondary values of, of range, so climate change, as well as there's there's overlap with range use and recreation, and um, especially in the northern areas, there's a lot of overlap with forestry. There's overlap with forestry all through the province <clears throat> in terms of range, as those zones of use can influence silviculture strategies, harvesting methods, uh, ecological restoration, or natural range barrier uh, mitigation. Um, Rangeland health data can be incorporated into, into the range planning maps. Uh, rangeland health data is generally recorded as point data. And so, but it's, it's assigned a score of um, uh, highly at risk, moderately at risk, non-functional or properly, properly functioning or slightly at risk. And so that point data can be taken and applied and create and polygons created that overlap the forage categories. And this is important because rangeland health influences forage production. So the clipping and the forage values that, that I showed earlier um, need to be adjusted to rangeland health. And by applying these this, this rangeland health data over top of the forage category polygons, uh, it assists with, with assigning actual uh, forage values to those areas. And it also provides a better representation of what the range condition is on the landscape than what the points do. And this is so the reason so so the reason that that range health is important is as you know if our potential product productivity is 800 kilograms per hectare if it's uh, or a thousand kilograms per hectare and and if the rangeland health is moderately at risk then there needs to be a 50 percent deduction in the actual forage that's available. And so um, determining productivity on the landscape, it's, it's vital that uh, we understand what the range condition is. And the information can also, or the overlaying wildlife data, so color data. So the, the picture on the left is um, elk occurrence data from, from callers on, on, an, in an, on an elk herd. Uh, so understanding what is actually creating the, or reducing the rangeland health or influencing the, the, the forage production in the plant community, um, understanding where elk are, in some areas, understanding where wildlife are, are using areas, um, helps with sort of assigning a cause and effect, I guess, where, where um, we're trying to determine whether it's it's livestock or elk that are or or wildlife that are um, kind of creating uh, poor condition on some grassland areas, uh, this data can be can be vital for that. And so applying the the color data over top of the forage categories sort of shows where where wildlife are using the areas versus where livestock are using the areas. Um, on the far right. So sheep density, we can, we can get information on, um, on where specific wildlife species are, are using an area. And in this situation, the, the red line that's, I hope you can see my cursor, but there's a red sort of red hash mark that goes through the middle of this pasture. That is 1.5 kilometers from from this water source. And so generally, and based on the ground truthing, there's very little livestock beyond this, livestock use beyond this point, but there's significant sheep use out of this area. And so it, it assists with answering questions. Well, is there is there avoidance or sheep avoiding this area because of livestock or 
uh, or is this just the preferred habitat? And, and also there's um, culturally sensitive plants in this area. These are south facing slopes. So there's bitter root, balsam root, uh, mariposa lilies and things that are, are culturally important to the First Nations in this area. And understanding that um, there, maybe we want to limit livestock use in this zone because of A, because of the sheep use and also because of uh, the culturally significant plans in there. So if we're planning for range management, we wouldn't want to put another water development further out here to improve access to this area uh, because there's more conflicts that could be created. And so it can be used for planning, uh, for improving range management, but it can also be used to identify which areas we may want to be avoiding um, using livestock in, in, in future situations. And this, and that can be applied to any number of, uh, whether it's a recreation area or um, a sensitive ecosystem. Um, taking that wildlife data, understanding which pastures the wildlife are in also, there's what's called a, a safe use factor that's applied for grazing management. And, and um, in some areas it's, it's, it's applied as a, a take half, leave half type concept where you take half the forage and you leave half of it. But where we have higher use of, of from wildlife, we need to reduce the amount of forage that's being taken from or being allocated to livestock. And so uh, in the trench, oftentimes where they can identify where there's overlapping use of, of grazing animals, they can apply a, uh, a lesser safe use factor when they're allocating um, allocating forage for, for livestock and or for, for wildlife. And this helps assign uh, allocations to specific pastures and gives them an idea as to, you know, was a pasture over allocated based on long rangeland health and wildlife numbers and distance to water. There's also what's called a flow accumulation uh, map and zones of use, uh, or that can be overlapped with the zones of use to assist with uh, planning water developments. So if we have our green area that is uh, considered to be resilient in future climate change scenarios, but we have these large areas that are outside of, of, the, the, of the green um, uh, polygons, then these areas can be explored for um, improving water resources. Or if we have a, a stream, a high value stream, then it's likely that livestock are probably putting a lot of pressure on this area. And so we can, uh, we can use uh, these maps to sort of help stratify where we're gonna do rangeland health assessments uh, or where, where infrastructure might be required to limit, uh, limit use by livestock along a certain area. And so it helps, these maps help sort of identify where potential conflicts could occur or where potential opportunities for livestock grazing are if there's if there's zones with high forage production but little water and, and maybe there can be uh, water brought into those zones. And the flow accumulation isn't necessarily a unit, it's just a uh, por portion of a landscape. So, so a, uh, a high flow zone in one landscape may not translate into a high flow zone in another landscape based on just its uh, geographic context. And those flow accumulation lines are also used. So we've got, we have, we have red, zone, red zones of use. So those are areas that are threatened in future climate situa situations. We have green zones, which are considered um, not at risk in future climate scenarios. And then we have these, these blue zones or these hash zones. So those are areas where the flow accumulation lines are suggesting that there's through flow of water through these ponds and, and that because they are small doesn't necessarily mean they are at risk to climate change scenario. It just, it, what, these, what these blue circles are representing are basically connected ponds. So ponds that are connected through groundwater flow based on, on having a high portion of flow accumulation that comes through their, their watershed. And so these areas are also considered resilient. And this is, up till now, we haven't, up till this year, we haven't used these for planning, but we're going to, um, we've been generally considering, the model has been mostly predicting what is, uh, we're just assuming that everything's closed basin, but now we are bringing in this, uh, an additional element to predict what is uh, connected and, and 
see if this additional layer helps with planning range management. And so that's what uh, we've got a couple of projects this summer that we're going to be looking at using this, this um, characteristic. Uh, other things that get brought in are, are uh, forestry, forestry layers. So we can bring in uh, cut block age and things like that. And that can also be applied to the forage category. Um, disturbance, so, so year since fire is an important aspect or polygon to bring in uh, to show where fires have occurred on the landscape. And that also helps us determine um, not only the forage category, but the forage production within those categories. Uh, they help, these maps help uh, focus rangeland health assessments for, for people that may be new to uh, an area or to a range unit. Uh, it can show sort of where the predicted high zones of use are when you're new to the Forest Service or something as an, a range agrologist and you're asked to go out and do um, rangeland health assessments on a range unit that can be 20,000 hectares in size. Uh, it's, it's nice having um, some starting points and, and these maps can assist with that. Um, as I demonstrated, they're, they're useful for planning the forage inventory assessments and evaluating AUM allocations on existing tenures so it can assist um, with, with applications for uh, new tenures or for um, questions around whether an, an area is over allocated or just whether or not there's um, poor distribution or something along those lines. And so it can also plan for AUM allocations on advertised tenures using this, this strategy. And so the final, the forage table that comes out, it, uh, the, what's available for livestock depends on, on the forage category, um, as well as the range on health, the needs of wildlife, uh, ecological values. So generally we uh, range management, the principles of range management dictate that we should be leaving, you know, at least 50% of the forage out there for ecological values. Some areas are now suggesting that um, we should be, should be leaving uh, closer to, to 65%. Um, topography and slope can also be brought in. That also influences uh, where livestock will travel, distance to water, and then barriers to movement, whether it's fencing or, or natural range barriers. So all those aspects get brought into, um, brought into the decisions around uh, forage allocation and, and the maps that are within, associated with this project assist with with uh, creating these tables and and um, yeah, identifying or a, a proper allocation for forage. Um, this project was in the Caribou. This is one of the pilot projects, and so uh, the existing range unit is this kind of dark black boundary, and the tenure has has reasonably good had reasonably good water in the southern portion of the tenure, but this area up here, and so the, the, these circles right here, they weren't, they were non-existent, this, this green polygon. And so there was no water in this area, no easily accessible water, or it was associated with a stream where they didn't want livestock going into. And so uh, three water developments were created in this zone um, based on, on these creeks and distance to, to water. So it's, it's created uh, offsite watering to, to keep the livestock out of, um, out of some perennial streams, as well as providing livestock a forage resource that they otherwise wouldn't have had because they wouldn't have been able to access it because of the distance to water and the distance that they had to travel. Uh, another example is um, in Batania Flats, so close to Risky Creek in the Caribou as well. Um, this is an area that has a, um, there is a perennial stream that flows through, but really there is no other water. There's some at-risk water here and some water that's associated with this pasture, um, but creating a water development in, within this pasture was a, was a need. And so the flow accumulation lines were were used to identify where um, the mo most of the through flow of water uh, was coming through this through this stream, and it seems intuitive in that uh, yes, it's the further down the stream you go, the more water you're going to get. But um, it's not from a planning standpoint on a sixty thousand hectare range area. Um, having some points identified ahead of time 
for planning and for ground truthing um, is is essential. And so this um, yeah this tool was was used for for planning here as well. Uh, so in conclusion, um, we found that this forage and water resiliency tool is useful when discussing range use on the landscape. It brings the forage inventory and the areas of use to the table when discussing range management. Um, it helps managers, you know, how to how mitigation strategies or infrastructure can be used most efficiently. Um, it stratifies the landscape to assist with with range on health assessments and provides valuable information uh, to determine carrying capacity and forage allocation. Um, we've also found that using the maps, uh, it, it, it is assisted with um, just discussions with other land users, especially, and, and it shows where the forage resource is and it, and it kind of sh shows how, how livestock use the landscape. And then it also demonstrates what uh, the risks to livestock are um, in future climate scenarios when, when grazing on, on Crown Range, and then also identifies where there's potential uh, overlap and, and conflicting uh, use. Um, yeah, there's the funding support and my acknowledgement slide, and um, I managed to stay under an hour, so um, I'm well under an hour. So yeah, I'm I'm happy to answer any questions if there's any out there. Um, yeah. So, thank you, Andrew, for uh, sharing your valuable information with us. So let's see if anybody has some questions. We'll go first. Yeah, thank you, Andrew, for a very informative presentation. Uh, I tried to catch up many different slides because it's not particularly what I do, but uh, what I am interested in, like the use of future projections, uh, can you comment on like, you mentioned climate model. So is it a regional climate model that is used to downscale the like- uh, Yeah, exactly. So it, yeah, so it's just it basically, so the data comes from Climate BC and it's just, it's an ensemble of uh, 15 models, I guess is how is, is how I would describe it. And so um, the person that does all the GIS modeling is, his name's Darren Brooks. He's out of uh, um, the University of North Atlantic. He actually used to be in Prince George and I believe he worked with, um, well, he did his master's at, U at UMBC. Um, but so Darren, and so he has quite a bit of experience working in forestry. Um, in, in BC and so he's yeah but he's he's responsible for the modeling um, aspect of things and so it's we generally just use yeah the, the like a downscaled climate model is what so it's a mm -hmm. ensemble of models right that's yeah I can um, let's see if I can bring up I do have a couple of minutes here so let's just give me a second all climate BC yeah yeah they have a website. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And now they data, data specific locations. Yeah. But like, uh, I was just trying to figure out the scenario. Which scenario. So it is, let's see. So we're using, we're generally using the guidance, well, yeah, we're generally using guidance that was provided by uh, Dave Spillhouse and company. Um, and so we use the, we don't use the worst case scenario, we're using the RCP 4.5. Oh. And for our, for our EREF, so our reference evaporation, as well as our precipitation, is coming from that. Okay. Um, Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. So this is yeah. So all our climate BC for all our current data, this future periods using this fifteen GCM ensemble with with the four point five RCP four point five. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you. Any more questions? I have a quick question. Yep. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I was wondering, hearing your presentation, it sounds like you've done quite a bit of work in southern BC and then maybe in the Caribou country. I would see a lot of interest in this actually in the Nichaco watershed. So the Vanderhoof Agricultural Belt, where there's a lot of rangeland. Um, so I, I don't know if in the future you'd be interested in working um, in some of these applications towards the Nichaco watershed. Yeah, we are 100%. We're, so, um, so we applied some of it over, uh, I guess, south of Francois Lake um, last year. All, so the so all the data can be clipped to those areas. Um, okay. The and so where I guess it, it kind of falls apart is because the the evaporation rates are obviously less in comparison. Maybe not necessarily, but the, but the balance, the water balance is is more um, is tighter, I guess. With small ponds, so it, so those small ponds aren't necessarily drying up in that northern area, but I think it would be really relevant in that Vanderhoof, um, in that Vanderhoof zone, yeah, especially, yeah, yeah, because that is quite a quite a good agricultural belt. Um, we've been trying to get on with um, involved land use plans in Lakes District, um, so any any kind of opportunity. Um, we have to apply the model. We 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 try to participate in those conversations. So um, yeah, community community pasture planning and things like that, as well as natural range barrier planning, uh, is pretty relevant throughout that area that you're talking about. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Thank you.